behind the line, great reinforcement. In the line, Rommel had come for us again. It was two months later. He told his troops that on this day, they were going to Cairo. But five days afterwards, he withdrew. He left nearly 300 tanks behind to prove his generalship. three months, we recreated and greatly enlarged the 8th Army. Into Middle East ports came men from the United Kingdom, India, and South Africa. The 44th Home Counties Division and the 51st Highland Division had actually left Britain in May and June. And it was at the time Tobruk fell that President Roosevelt, who had Mr. Churchill with him at the time, ordered the first Sherman tanks to Egypt. Long-range planning was yielding its reward. The Air Force kept guard. supply line one-tenth the length of ours was himself building up his supplies as hard as he could go. But for a considerable proportion of them, there was no future. Our United Air Forces saw to that. fleet air arm also were busy destroying Rommel's convoys. Within a few weeks, our Mediterranean submarines sank or damaged 24 enemy ships. In August alone, of all that were shipped to him, 80% went to the bottom. and the hardness of an army is one of the biggest battle-winning factors in war. When two first-class fighters meet, he who sticks it longest wins in the end. This has been proved time and time again and applies to all ranks, from general officers to private soldiers. And this includes all branches of the army, whatever their job and wherever they be. Fighting fit and fit to fight.
October, preparations on both sides were nearing completion. In the north, Rommel's forces stretched from the coast to a point ten miles inland. Here were the bulk of his German infantry, comprising the 90th Light and the 164th Divisions, together with the Italian Trieste Division. In the south, holding a front of 14 miles, were three Italian divisions. These were strengthened by the rest of his German infantry. The centre was left deliberately weak, held by a single Italian division, the Bologna, holding a front of 16 miles. Behind the infantry in the north were two armoured divisions, one German and one Italian, and similarly in the south. The British line began in the north with the 9th Australians, and below them, the 1st South Africans. The 51st Highland Division, who had St. Valerie to avenge, and the 4th Indian Division, veterans of Abyssinia and the Western Desert, held the centre. In the south were the 50th Division from the Tees and Tyne, with the fighting French of Bir Hakim and contingents of Greeks. The tactical reserve was found by the 44th Division from counties close to London. Our armoured divisions were three, all United Kingdom men, some veterans of a score of desert battles, others new to the work. One division, the famous 7th, held the extreme south. The other two were in close support in the north with the 2nd New Zealand Infantry Division alongside. <laughs> was full of confidence. He was saying to journalists in Berlin, you may rely on our holding fast to what we have got. We hold the gateway to Egypt with the full intention to act. Hitler was experiencing one of his historic intuitions. He saw before him the destined conqueror of Egypt, and on him he bestowed the baton of Field Marshal. Rommel hoped that if we attacked first, we should strike at his center. That hope we deliberately encouraged by the disposition of our forces. Having allowed our armor to break through, he saw himself destroying it by attacks from both flanks. That done, his own offensive would be launched. General Alexander, Admiral Harwood and Air Marshal Tedder planned our men together. It was to be a joint operation. Unity of command had become a reality. In the desert itself, General Montgomery and Air Vice Marshal Cunningham lived cheek by jowl. There was no divided command, said General Montgomery. There was only one command. 